Hi, everybody. Welcome to Women of Innovation. We are so excited to have you all here. Uh, we've got a big, big lineup today and tomorrow, so we hope that you're with us all day. You know, last year we were sitting around brainstorming about what did Dallas Startup Week need, and a women said, we want our own day. We want our own speakers. Um, so we're super excited. This is our second annual, and the, the lineup is still really amazing. I want to give a shout out to the committee that put this all together, that headed by Dresden Goldberg, who is an amazing gal that heads up innovation over at UTD, uh, and all the people that kind of made this come together, because it is not an easy thing to do. A um, couple things for you to know. One on the right hand side, you'll see there's two um, um, there's two little tabs. One, if you want to ask questions of Jamie, you can put questions in there. You can network in there. The other thing we have is polls. So make sure that you say what you like and what you don't like. because That gives us feedback to just be better next year. Um, on the left hand side, you'll also see marketplace. So during the day today and tomorrow, not only do we have a sponsor area, but we have a marketplace area for um, for really great vendors. And you, and you know, it's so funny that we had, I'm looking at the gals that are working with me. Everyone was like, how is this going to work? Because of course, you know, everything being virtual, it's really working well. So it's really up to you if you want to network, if you want to meet people. Your job is to be active. And we've seen a lot of that over the last two days. Um, and don't forget tonight's keynote. Uh, so we're really excited about that. I'll talk more about that afterwards. Uh, our next speaker is really a wonderful, amazing woman for a number of reasons, not just because, you know, she built a little beauty empire, uh, but because she's got three kids and a family and she finds time to do this. We did a, uh, I'll tell you a quick funny story is we were, um, we did a trial here, you know, kind of a run through and, you know, we're all kind of nervous because, you know, like Jane gorgeous and she's a beauty person. So of course it's kind of like everyone. So the first time we met her, we all had our hair up. It was only a practice. Of course she comes on beautiful and then she's nice. It's like, really? She's both things. And she was really excited about hearing her vision and her heart for entrepreneurs. So we're super excited and uh, we're going to do, we're going to have a Q&A at the end. So again, start writing your questions. And right now we're going to do a little sizzle reel and then you are going to get to hear from the president and CEO of Beauty Bio. Am I still talking? <laughs> Is that what? Please hold. We have the video coming right. It is. It is. Oh, they don't need me. Yeah. It should be coming through. Is it yeah. coming through? Do you see it? Okay. All right, I'll, Jamie. I'll tell you don't, don't click that button. Okay. Do you want me to not have a volume? Knock them dead, Jamie. Yeah, we'll just toss to you when it's done. We're just gonna, when the video's done, go right to you. Awesome, just give me the thumbs up. I will. Because I can't see the video. Yeah, okay. you're good. <laughs> we can't. It's happening, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello everyone, Jamie O'Banion here. I'm so excited to be here with you this morning, albeit virtually. Um, this is an exciting moment. It's an exciting moment in our history for women. It's an exciting moment for our city. And I'm often asked when I'm in New York or London or Shanghai, what do you love about Dallas? It's crazy you're in Dallas. Why is Dallas so great? Dallas is the greatest city in the world. I really believe that. And there is such an incredible, natural entrepreneurial spirit. I don't know if it's because it's you know, the Wild West and Texas is, has such pride and at any moment feels like it could be its own, its own empire, its own country. Um, but I love it. I love the energy here. It's such a beautiful breeding ground for building dreams. 
from making things happen. So today, this moment is all about sharing some of the things that I've learned, some of the things that I wish I would have known um, over a decade ago, and I hope that they can be helpful. I didn't necessarily have a mentor per se, and because of that, I'd made a commitment to myself that I'm going to help share what I wish I would have had uh, the benefit of uh, being shared to me along along my journey. So I'm sure everyone who's listening is at different stages of their business. Maybe it's just an idea right now. Maybe you're already down the line and you're um, getting to whatever your, your finish line was for you mentally. Um, but regardless, these are things that I think I've been able to curate together into a collection of the five most meaningful things in my opinion, to help build a successful business today. And today that word is really important because we live in a different normal, right? And um, it has been an absolute uh, blessing, I will tell you this year with everything going on for us to be able to have had the success that we've had and be able to outperform the front half of our year. And there were a lot of very deliberate um, pivots that went into that. And we're going to talk about that as well as, as one of the pillars. So first, what we're going to do is I have a little presentation I'll share with you. So I'm going to um, present my screen here and we're going to just head on in. And I'm going to share with you guys a few things. So you already saw our awesome video and I shared that and wanted you guys to see that because it's easy on the outside for things to look really glossy and simple, right? But the reality is there's a lot of very unglamorous behind the scenes that happens um, to get a business to a point where it can move forward in an autonomous fashion. So today we're going to be talking about five pillars for building a successful business. Let's start with the first slide. This is something that I love as a great visual because every single entrepreneur jumps off the proverbial cliff and builds an airplane on the way down, right? Um, flip to the next slide. Successful entrepreneurs also jump off the cliff, are also building a plane on the way down. But here's the key difference that I've observed. Successful entrepreneurs aren't just building the plane, they are also installing multiple parachutes, extra jetpacks, and probably have a series of trampolines at the bottom of the cliff, just in case. And the interesting thing that successful entrepreneurs all have as a common denominator is they share a deep desire to move forward in their businesses and their life with measured risk approach. And what I mean by that is it's, it's easy to look at an entrepreneur and say, oh, risk taker, you know, caution to the wind and, and uh, you know, jump out the plane. No, successful entrepreneurs are actually quite risk averse and believe in taking measured, carefully calculated risks. And that comes with always having not just a plan B, but a plan C, D, E, F, G, all the way to Z because the one thing constant in an entrepreneur's life is facing constant challenges and constant change. And it's something that you have to really um, love. You have to love the, um, the constant shifting and the high that you get from being able to problem solve. And we'll get into this a little bit later, but I tell my team, and I'll say it now in the beginning of the presentation, because I really want you to let it marinate for a second. Every day as an entrepreneur, there will always be problems that are put on your lap every single day, multiple times throughout the day. And years ago, I stopped viewing them as problems and I started viewing them as puzzles. If you love puzzles, raise your hand. If I could see you, I would be raising it with you. I love puzzles. It's hard for me to stop once I start. Um, and if you think about the problems that come to you, you know, you head down a path and, oh shoot, dead end, what do I do? I pivot. Um, think of them as opportunities. Think of them as puzzles. Your conversion rate is too low on your homepage. Okay, great. No problem. It's not a failure. It's a, it's a puzzle. Well, let's figure it out. Let's move this up here and try this and shift this around. And when you approach it that way, it can be quite fun. 
when you're you're given these these puzzles every day to succeed. So part of successful entrepreneurship is yes, we all leap off the cliff, but really thinking through every worst case scenario, every worst case scenario, and then do your very best to plan against it. And then when it comes, you've already lived it. So it's not overwhelming. It's not surprising. It's like, okay, all right. Well, if this happened, which I consider it might, here's what I'm going to do. And it's easy to follow on from there. So I'm a data-driven girl. I love data. I'm a believer that if you want to, you nine times out of 10 can dig in and assemble a series of facts that will help you come to a more logical conclusion. So I, I feel comfortable, very armed with, with data. So let's look at a few of the facts, okay? One in five businesses fail in the first 12 months. Pretty shocking. And there are statistics that cite these numbers even, even higher, but we're gonna go with what the US Small Business Administration um, reports. 50% survive, so out of those one in five, so we have four left over, right? Of those four, 50% of them survive five years. Of the balance remaining, 30% of those businesses celebrate 10 years in business. We're celebrating our 10th year yes, next year, so I think that, that's a good thing. 82% um, of business, let's explore what's the number one reason that businesses fail. And I love this exercise because I want to know all of the landmines. Before I walk out of the field, I want to know all of the, or as many as I can, the potential landmines so I can prepare. I can build those parachutes, build the jetpack so I'm ready, right? 82% of businesses, so the number one reason that businesses fail, issues surrounding cash flow. Right. There's an old saying that says, you know, businesses don't fail. They just run out of money. Right. So really thinking through your cash flow and notice it's not honestly just running out of money. It's cash flow. It's cash management. It's not helpful if you have to pay your credit card bills today. But you're getting paid at the end of the year. You can't say I'm going to shore all up at the end of the year. We're going to be good. You got to pay bills today. Right. So really understanding and managing cash flow. It, we might be, you know, Vogue magazine and Allure Best of Beauty and all of this great things. At the end of the day, I mean, we could be selling paper towels. We still have to manage our cash, right? So it's really important to understand that because a lot of really creative founders, um, that, that can be a challenge. So um, managing cash flow is important. Having someone on your team that can assist you if that's not, not your wheelhouse. 90% um, of startups fail. 90%. Um, businesses run, I thought this was an interesting statistic by MIT's um, Sloan School of Management. Businesses run by someone younger than 30 fail twice as often. I started Beauty Bio in my late 20s. Um, and I'm sharing that with you because not every business that starts, if you're under 30 today, does that mean that it's going to, to fail? Of course not. But let's understand why. That is one of the most important helpful tools in a word that you can utilize as a founder. Why? Why did this happen? I am always far less concerned with what happened in our company than I am why it happened. What hindsight's 2020? I can't fix the past, but I can affect the future. So let's understand why it happened, right? So in this particular statistic, why could be an experience, could be didn't have a certain skill set. So exploring the why something happens, is there a, an SOP that needs to be implemented internally because there's, there's a gap in communication between departments, understanding and seeking to solve for the why. Um, lastly, only 2% of U.S. businesses achieve annual revenues of $10 million. Um, sharing that because, again, I like to take a look at what does the playing field look like? And you know, what am I stepping into so that I can have eyes wide open and try to learn from other businesses that perhaps went down a path that I can avoid um, as it pertains to, to our line of business. So let's explore the top five reasons that business fail, right? So here they are, and this is um, synthesized across several different platforms. This is what most people report, report out. And I agree with this. Uh, cash flow mismanagement, number one, again, running out of money. If you have a cash cycle that it takes, you know, 
six months for someone to pay you and you have to pay your vendor, you're going to be in a bad spot, right? Um, number two, leadership failure. Leadership failure, and we'll, we'll talk about that in more depth. Number three, lacking a unique value prop, right? So there are a lot of businesses that, that launch, but if it's not unique, if it's not sticky, if it's not adding value to uh, a large majority of consumers, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge to have a material customer base that's sustainable for you as a business. Um, number four is a flawed business model. And this one's always really funny, not funny. Um, we can, you know, we all can sit back and laugh at our, th our choices that we wish we would have made differently. Um, but it's always interesting to me. There's such a rich, beautiful, common denominator of passion among founders. Everyone jumps off the cliff passionately, right? Um, I want to start a cookie business. I want to start a this or a that. And it's interesting because um, one of the things I see commonly among founders is, there's so much um, time and energy spent on the aesthetic or the concept. And, you know, the cookie shop is going to be this, or we're going to have this t-shirt and it's going to be so great. And the recipe is so wonderful, but it always surprises me how many people fail to sit down and actually put just even a very simple business model together to say, okay, when it's all netted out, did you know that the average founder median income for a startup is between 50 and $61,000. So a lot of time, a lot of energy, many of them fail. And it's definitely not, you know, putting you on the path to, uh, you know, some incredibly amazing, you know, package, if that's what you're, what you're envisioning. Start with understanding your motives for doing what you're doing. And then really put together a solid business model. And if you go, man, at the end of the day, I'm working 14 hours a day and walking home with 50 grand. If that's okay with you, awesome. If it's not okay with you, really flushing out what that business model looks like and thinking, okay, is there a, a way that I exit? And I was talking to a founder uh, last weekend and you know, she said, I started this business. I love this business, but I'm ready to do something else. And now I don't have a way out. I, I'm not a business that someone could acquire. So do I just shut my doors and you know it was a real crisis for her so really thinking through am i in this for the long haul is this what i want to be doing for the rest of my life if i'm am i setting myself putting myself on a path that i want to be acquired one day okay well who are the acquirers and if i getting into a vein of business that there's enough opportunity down the road for me to see a path towards exit whether we can execute that or not that's uh you know what we're going to be discussing but at least having that that target that trajectory and number five is the inability to scale so again, let's take the cookie shop example. You open a cookie shop, you love the idea of the cookie shop, but all of a sudden you realize, man, this cookie shop can only ever has the potential of making a million dollars a year to get where I need to go running the math. I need to open a hundred cookie shops, right? Um, does your business have the ability to scale? At some point you'll reach the ceiling, how high is too high? And that's, especially if you're going down the vendor private equity group, you, you have to have the ability to scale. That's a non-starter for most um, funds. If that's your path, you've got to have the ability to scale. So let's talk about now. Um, my brain process is that I want to understand all of the opportunities for failure so that as I put a plan together for success, I make sure that I'm addressing each of those landmines and putting together a solid strategy going forward. So five keys to help your business succeed today. These are things that you can implement today. And lastly, you've got this. Remember that you, you can do this. I fully believe that everyone who is listening to this right now, everyone listening or not is fully equipped with everything they need to be successful. We are an amazing species. And I will tell you, you can do anything you want to do in life, if you're willing to work hard, lean on others, and bet on yourself 11 out of 10 times. You can do anything you want to do. So pillar number one, begin with the end in mind. This is one of my favorite statements. I want to say it was um, Covey, I think, was one that really coined this phrase, and I love it. Begin with the end in mind. Um, why is that important, right? If I know that I'm walking into... Um, a, a race. I'm going to run the Boston. Okay. Not a runner, not an athlete. I run a mental marathon every day. That's my exercise. 
Um, but if I know that that's what I'm stepping into, I can get in that mindset. I can pace myself, know the water breaks I need to take along the way. And I'm, I'm, I'm heading towards that finish, finish line. It's so important. When you begin with the end in mind, you develop that pressure tested, scalable plan. You're able to define the ceiling. If I'm assessing, uh, we were looking at going into Italy as a market. Honestly, market cap wasn't big enough for us. I reallocated our resource towards the UK and Asia because with the same amount of energy, the yield was 50x what that particular market was. So being able to uh, trim, pivot, and set forth a path that is um, one that can be properly executed in the most efficient manner, defining what that ceiling looks like, right? Um, next is pulling together best case scenario, a good scenario, and then draconian worst case scenarios. Why is that important? No one a year ago could have predicted the situation that we're in today. And as soon as COVID hit, I immediately went into capital conservation mode, right? Anywhere we could cut costs, I had no idea what the future would hold, a lot of uncertainty in the market. So immediately we didn't wait, we started to trim everywhere that we could trim because as the leader of our company, I needed to make sure that we were prepared for whatever happened and however long it happened. So really having those best worst case and then gating into them. So, okay, great. You make your first quarter. Fantastic. Now we can open and reallocate budget. You make Q2. Brilliant. Now this is what the back half of the year looks like, but gating in a smart fashion responsibly into those thresholds. That's one of the biggest pitfalls of businesses is they try to scale too quickly and they don't have the in infrastructure, they don't have the capital, um, stickiness in the market, and then there's ultimate collapse. Uh, the big why and the why not, right? I think this is really, really important to take a minute and understand really like a soul searching moment to understand why you're doing what you're doing. Because if you're doing what you're doing for um, a monetary gain or benefit, that's really poor gasoline, really poor fuel to get you to where you wanna go. It's something you need to be genuinely passionate about, passionate enough to work for years, really long days with um, an enormous amount of pressure. You've gotta have that type of fuel to sustain you through the finish line, whatever your finish line looks like, right? So really having that assessing moment of, are you doing it because it sounds fun? Are you doing it because you really believe in it? Are you doing it because uh, it's something that you're deeply passionate about? Really assessing why. And then remembering the words, why not? My mother always said to me growing up, and I love this, if not me, who? If not now, when? And I recommend writing that down. If not me, who? If not now, when that can apply to getting out of bed and making that bed in the morning. If I don't do it, who's going to do it right um, to why not? Why not you be the one to start the business? Why not? Why can't you? You can. You absolutely can. So remembering the power of both of those words, why and then why not? Um, identify the footprints. Uh, one of the best ways to hopefully ensure a greater likelihood by the numbers of success is look at the path of who's done it before. Who has gone before you? Is there anyone in the marketplace? They might not have the exact same value prop, but is there someone that has successfully, um, if you're looking to exit, okay, well, what are the brands in CPG or in whatever your vein of business is? And there are going to be some data points for you to establish internal KPIs that you say, okay, I have a high level of confidence that following these footprints in the sand from other brands or companies that have done it that are somewhat similar, I have a high level of confidence that I can build a case for uh, what this path looks like. Next, number two, be customer obsessed. It's always amazing to me, I, I truly like shocking, how many people forget the reason they started, right? Your consumers, are literally the lifeblood of your company. It doesn't matter how tight your supply chain is. It doesn't matter how beautifully assembled your PL is. It does not matter that you have the greatest team happy hour on the planet Earth. If you don't have a customer, you do not have a business. 
And a few quotes that I say constantly to the team, um, you'll know the right answer for every choice, every time, if you put your customer hat on. And sometimes we'll look at, you know, creative artwork or what, oh, it looks beautiful. Would it make you click on it? Would you buy it if you were served this ad in store? And if the answer isn't yes, then we're not there yet, right? We're not there yet. Another one that will um, hopefully be helpful, a confused customer never buys. You can't be everything to everyone. And most successful businesses, particularly in, in the CPG vein that we're in, consumer product goods, is you have to have that Trojan horse. If everything's important, nothing's important. So really zeroing in on if you're the cookie shop, you make the best darn chocolate chip cookie in all of South Texas, you know, whatever it might be, that is your, your thing. And then once you have that, what I call earned credibility, then it's easy to expand as you've gained the trust of the consumer, but really keying in on what that thing is that you will initially be known for and become sticky in the market. And then a confused customer never buys. So if you show her 12 different dresses, she's gonna walk away confused. Show her one or two, easily point her to why one is superior and you'll have a far greater likelihood of success. Um, if you're building a brand, not every company is a brand, but if you're building a brand, make sure that you have a very distinct voice. Be the kind of brand you'd wanna to go to dinner with. I tell my team that all the time, right? I want. I want to be able to know what my customer would eat for breakfast. Is it avocado toast with green juice? And, I mean, you should know your customer. We have pictures up of our customer, you know, our quote unquote customer. We know who she is, how old she is, what she eats for breakfast, what her income is, what her likes and dislikes are really knowing your customer makes it so much easier from an NPD perspective, from everything you're creating to um, share that with them. Live the consumer journey. If you live it, again, another one that is so simple and people often forget to do, live the consumer journey. You'll find opportunities for improvement. I regularly order product from our website or Sephora or Nordstrom just to see how it arrives to me. Was the tissue paper crazy? Was the marketing collateral? Did it make sense? Was it compelling? What are the opportunities? If you live it, just like you'd live a party, you know, what drink was served? What cocktail napkin? What was the music? What was the candle? How did it smell? Live the consumer journey. And you'll see right away, why do we do it this way? Or, well, that's confusing. Or, gosh, this was really hard to open for the consumer. I don't want someone, someone to be frustrated. If you live the consumer journey, you'll see so many opportunities to continue to improve. Um, next, guide the ship. And this one's really important, and it seems very straightforward, but you notice number two reason businesses fail is leadership management. And I use the word guide, not steer, because you can't do everything as your business scales. Um, I was running with one other person, a $10 million business, um, you know, eight years ago. How? Because we started on HSN and QVC and it takes the same amount of energy for me to talk to my HSN or QVC buyer who's going to order 50,000 units of something as it does to talk to, um, you know, a smaller boutique who might be ordering six units, right? So to scale myself and become more efficient, um, that's great. And I did everything from, you know, customer service in the beginning to all of our product development, everything. And I'm so grateful for that time because I'm able to lead with empathy because I have some, hopefully everyone I'm hiring can do it better and faster than, than I can, but I have a level of understanding and it helped me to easily identify in the beginning what the opportunities were from a process perspective and the key personnel that we needed as we grew our team. Um, so guiding, not just steering. You can't do everything. In the beginning, you'll be doing a lot. And I share that example because I get it. Um, but after you hit a certain scale, usually around you know 10 million or so in revenue, then it's time to you help lead and guide, but you can't steer the ship and run the mast and sweep the deck. You've got to have an incredible team. And what does the word lead mean? We talk about leader, but if you break down the word lead, the definition is to cause a person to go with one by holding them by the hand, a halter, a rope, et cetera, while moving forward. Causing a person to go with them, leading them, being a route or means of access to a particular place or a particular direction. Another word for that might be conduit, right? There are three critical responsibilities that only you, only you as the founder, 
as the leader or if you're a key executive um, in a startup can do. And these are three, and it is so important. Number one, define the destination. Guide the ship. It is your responsibility to let everyone know, here's where we're headed. I'm the captain of the ship. Here's the island. As a team, we're all going to move forward. If you don't, your ship will meander and eventually sink. Number two, set the priorities. Your team, all of us are really desperate to understand what's the priority today. And that's another pitfall that I see where if a priority isn't set and everyone doesn't understand, these are the critical things we call them in our company, the big rocks of the daily standup that every department has. What are the 10 things that must get done before everyone leaves today? And then as an executive team, what are the OKRs for this quarter? The things that have to get done as we move the company forward. And it's really important because you create these data points to benchmark against so you can say, yeah, we progress over the last 90 days at this quarter, here's what we're able to accomplish. And then you set another peg and then you move towards that. Really, really important. Teams need someone. They're counting on you to set the destination, to set the priorities so everyone can march in the same direction. Um, and then lastly, create systems of accountability, help implement processes, those checkpoints, those systems of accountability are really important to mark and track progress. Um, lastly, I've learned it's so critical to carefully se select your executive leadership for skill counterbalance. So if you know you, know, you hate uh, the financial piece of the business or maybe you love it, um, you really struggle managing the minutia from you know, an operations point of view, whatever it might be, make sure that you're hiring key leadership that can help fill in the gaps for you. And be willing and humble and honest enough to say, hey, these are not my strengths, or these are not things that I, that I enjoy or feel that I'm particularly great at, and that's okay. And bring in team members who can help assist you there. And then this, what I call microculture homogeny. Oftentimes you'll find different departments that function in a very healthy um, manner. And then you'll find departments in some companies that um, have their own separate microculture. So your leadership sets the tone. I can't have every single person in our company roll into me, right? Our leadership rolls into me. So it's critical that there's a saying, a fish, a fish rots from its head down. So within each department head, they are the leaders. Those are, those are my leaders. So it's important that they create homogeny within their department so that as a team, we can all have the same culture and energy and priorities that we're moving towards. Power of the pivot. Um, this is a really important one, point number four, definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. We've been able to be successful in this COVID environment because we literally overnight pivoted from our messaging to our value prop to how we uh, move forward, broadcasted almost 100 shows on QVC and HSN from home, broadcasted to Nordstrom last week, Sephora, uh, said, hey, let's try this. Immediately, we're able to partner and pivot. So important. Most companies, statistically, um, average three different iterations of their business before they really land in on this is who we are, what we are. It's okay to pivot. Um, especially, as I said, in this COVID environment, the winners can assess the situation, be decisive, pivot, and then do that check cycle over and over. Is what we're doing working? Hindsight's 2020. Great. Let's tweak here. Let's move forward. Remember, puzzles, not problems. And then when to love it enough to let go. And I'll tell you this, as a founder, we can be deeply passionate about something we believe in, but if it is not working, even if you love it personally and deeply, at some point you have to start, stop banging your head against the wall and move a different direction. And that can be hard when you really love something as a founder, you're really passionate about it, but if it's not working, you've got to pivot or the whole sink will ship and move on. Um, lastly, finding joy in the journey. It is not, it is not for the faint of heart to start and build a business. Uh, it takes a lot of sacrifice, a lot of sacrifice as a mother of three. Uh, my biggest sacrifice has been time away from my kids. Um, and it ebbs and flows, right? Last year, I embarrassingly flew 400,000 miles. I am beyond grateful that I have only had to make a few flights you know, in, of recent. It's the longest time I've been able to be home and I've loved every second getting to be there every night to tuck my kids in and let them know how much I love them. So 
remembering who you are and not compromising. We have one pie. So if work is taking up a lot of that pie, I cut out most all of the social and my family and, and my work, that's where my time is spent. And then if something eases off and you can add in, you know, another hobby or something, that's great. But just establish for yourself what your priorities are and what the things are that are important to you. We discuss, think of them as puzzles, not problems. That's so been so helpful to me. Um, one phrase that you'll hear me say on the daily is when something is, you know, put into your lap, what do we need to do to make it happen? There's always an answer. There might be 1,000 reasons why you can't, but there is one reason why you can, and we will find it. And if you start peeling back the layers, it's usually right there. Uh, we talked about motivation. Financial motivation is subpar fuel, right? It will not, there's no dollar amount, trust me, that when you're on the, you know, red eye to London, you're there for eight hours, you get back on a plane to go back to the U.S. and you're in New York. I, I mean, it's, it can be bananas and there is no dollar amount. You have to genuinely and passionately believe in what it is that you're building at a core level, in my opinion. And then remember that, think of this as a marathon, not a sprint. If you're building something because you're, we're going to get in 24 months, get in, get out. It, it typically, in my experience, chatting with other founders, it typically doesn't happen that way. So be of the mindset that this is something you believe in. This is going to be a marathon. If it ends up being a sprint, okay, great. But really getting in that mindset so you know. Remember that there's a messy middle. The beginning is really fun. There's a lot of adrenaline and stamina. And then there's that messy middle that people don't really talk about. There's a great book, The Messy Middle. And remember that that's, that's the hard part. That's that like long marathon piece where there are no people cheering you and handing you water bottles, right? That's the messy middle. And it can be hard. And oftentimes we see the beginning of things and we see the end of things. And it seemed like it happened overnight or it seemed like someone was just super lucky and you don't realize the messy middle and the hard work and you're in that messy middle a long time. And remember that there is light at the end of the tunnel and, and keep your head up and you've got this. And then lastly, this is something that's really important to ask you to consider and we'll wrap it. I know we, we are going um, right almost to our time, so you can let me know. But it says, happiness is 100% tied to expectation. And just let that marinate for 10 seconds. Happiness is 100% tied to expectation. If you can establish for yourself and have a really frank and open conversation with your heart, what you're endeavoring to build, what the sacrifice that will be for your family, so on and so forth, and you have, you're aligned with expectations, you will find joy in the journey and be able to look back over your shoulder and gasp when you see this beautiful view. And you should do that on occasion even if you're one foot off the ground or, you know, a thousand feet off the ground to look back and go, wow, this is great. If everything stopped tomorrow. What a, what a gift that you've been given. We've all been given to have opportunity of living in this amazing country. Um, but happiness is hundred percent tied to expectation. And that literally applies to everything. If I have an expectation that my amazing husband is going to be home at eight o'clock and he shows up at nine, I might feel a little like, Hey, what happened here? Right. Think of it, every single situation in life, it's all about managing expectations. So with your own team, with yourself, creating really clear expectations so there's no confusion, especially in a COVID environment, we're all working remotely, really clear expectations. Here's the reporting I need, here's a this, here's a that, here's what your work schedule will look like. All of those pieces are really important so that you can have joy in the journey and celebrate the amazing gift it is to get to build something that you really believe in. So lastly, dream then do. That is something that is close to my heart and I love. And I really recommend that everyone comes up with their personal uh, mantra, your personal, I call it a power statement. Mine is make it happen. It's what you tell your dog before you head out the door on another groundhog day and you're like, let's make it happen. Let's do this. Whatever. When you're having those hard moments, hard to press to the next level, something that you can tell yourself that will continue to motivate motivate you in that um, really core intrinsic way. Okay, you guys, I'm gonna toss it back um, over to our amazing moderators and we can take a couple of questions. Um, and I hope this was helpful to everyone. Helpful? This was so good. Oh, I'm glad. I expected you to be inspirational, um, but there's so many great nuggets and it's action packed and very instructional. And I think as women, that's what we want. We wanted some kind of roadmap, things to look for. 
Um, and if you look at the comments, I'm not alone. Uh, everyone is saying that it's been, it was so good. Um, if not me, who? Um, you have one pie. I like blueberry. Um, the messy middle. Um, I just measured risk. I think you just gave us some really great things to really be very, um, to really think through. Um, so one of the things I wanted to ask you, one of the questions that came up was, what was an idea you had that was that you thought well, this is going to be great and it wasn't? And then vice oh versa, gosh. an idea you said, you know, I'm not sure, but then it turned out to be wonderful. Such a great question. Should I start with yesterday? Or <laughs> um, I will say that's one thing that's a true common denominator I found across founders is there's never a lack of ideas, right? There's mm -hmm. never a lack of concept. It's a matter of being choosy and looking at it through a filter of data, being able to bounce it off of people that you trust uh, and then decide which earns a spot on the team, right? Mm -hmm. So I can think of, um, oh, and it, it was a, a product that we launched that was personally so helpful to me, something that I loved done some initial testing focus group and so forth and we launched it and it did okay it didn't do everything that i expected it to do mm -hmm. and um it was it was great because i i always believe you're never failing mm -hmm. you're editing exactly every single thing tells you something it's like dating you know like oh i definitely need someone with a sense of humor that did not work you know you <laughs> learn and you curate you know what success looks like but that's key is that learning, you know, being able to be open and I think, you know, have enough humility to say, okay, so that wasn't what I thought it would be. What, what, what was great about it and what could have been better. Right. Um, and then I remember when we launched GlowPro, which has become the number one um, beauty tool in North America, you know, knock on wood. And honestly, it's something I was deeply passionate about. We had filed the patent for it. It was something that in the professional space, we, knew was having a lot of success, uh, was not sure how it would translate to the consumer space. Um, I was one of the first to launch into organic skincare at the beginning of our career and people didn't get it. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what it was. And now it's, now it's cool to be clean. Now it's cool to be, you know, right. whatever. And that's, you know, one of the things I was referencing earlier is that really it was just ahead of its time simply because there wasn't enough market education. And as a small brand, I don't have a lot of, I didn't have a lot of budget at the time, right? <laughs> to be able to educate the entire market. So it's not always about being first, it's about being best in class, right? I think Absolutely. Lyft launched before Uber, right? Um, so with GlowPro, knew it worked in the professional space. And I will tell you, I remember vividly, um, we launched at Neiman Marcus and on HSN uh, within two weeks of each other. And then we launched to Sephora at Nordstrom. There's a you know, really mm -hmm. clear kind of hierarchy of you know, how, you, how you wanna launch as you build the brand. And follow your footprint, follow your, you know, follow your path, your path forward. And I remember sitting on air and literally before the, the lights came on and the cameras went live and it's all live thinking, do I even use the word microneedling? Needling sounds kind of intense. And I had already come up with, you know, a different, you know, calling micro channels and micro stimulation because needles can be scary. And I'm sitting on the sofa with Amy, who's their number one beauty host. And I launch into it. I'd come up with, you know, this kind of visual demonstration where I had this little jar of M&Ms in different colors to show layers of your skin because that seemed to me more digestible than something that was scary. So I took a little pen and kind of showed here's what it does in your skin. And and then Amy just blurts out, it's microneedling, ladies. Everybody needs it. And I'm like, well, and I was out there. So we're just going to see how that falls. And we ended up having a record sellout and sold out of all of our inventory in 12 minutes. And it's amazing. I mean, it, it's, and it hasn't, you know, slowed down since. And my point there is you have to be able to be disruptive and take a risk. And that was one of the points of failure is you have to be unique enough in the marketplace that there is that stickiness and then you have to own it. Mm -hmm. And shame on me for not, having enough trust in our consumer base that they would get it and understand and good for Amy for saying, here's what it is. And here, here's where we are. And that has really helped me to be always uber transparent and yeah. have so much trust in our marketplace that she gets it. She yeah. understands what it is. And we have a super smart consumer base that does get it.
And right. that's been incredible for us. You saw the neon sign in our conference room, Truth and Beauty. I yep. never think of myself as selling. I'm I'm helping. And right. if someone wants to try it, great. If they don't, that's okay too. Right. But I think when you look at it through that vantage point, that is again the fuel that will carry you forward because it's something that is bigger than a product or a thing. It's helping other people so they can make proper choices and and understand their skin health better. Well, you are amazing, uh, you know, on a number of levels, but we so appreciate that you've given your time yeah. to other entrepreneurs because there are other Jamie Banyans that are listening today. Yes, and, I, and you're going to yeah. crush it. Absolutely. And I know I'm cheering for you from the sidelines and so excited to see what Dallas continues to bring to the marketplace. I am with you. Thank you so, so much for Thank your time. You, my friend. Absolutely. Ladies, we've got so much more for you. So uh, one, remember the marketplace is over at the left. So go visit our vendors. A big, big, huge shout out, if I can get any louder, is Thomson Reuters. We can't do programs with this like this without sponsors. And um, between Thomson Reuters and Capital One, they really, really believe um, in women and they believe in women entrepreneurs and they believe in Dallas. So we're super, super thankful that they are continue to be such a big supporter of ours. So come back at 1130 because we have yet again, another great woman speaker to talk to us. Thanks again, Jamie. And have a great rest of your Thanks, day. Everyone. You